Good evening and welcome. This is the first of two nights that we have set aside to hear from the community on the superintendent's fiscal FY24 operating budget proposal for the Board of Education. Tonight's hearing will be broadcast live on television and MCPS media. As always, board members are looking forward to hearing and considering your input to review and act on the superintendent's recommendations. Before we begin, I will ask board members to introduce themselves, and Dr. McKnight and several MCPS staff members have joined us here as well tonight. I'll start with Ms. Yang. Julie Yang. Ms. Harris. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Good evening. I'm Rebecca Smondrowski. Thanks for coming. Good evening, Shebra Evans. Good evening, Carla Sylvester. Good evening, Brenda Wolf. Good evening, everyone. Grace Rivera Oven, District 1. Good evening, Arvin Kim. Thanks for being here. Dr. McKnight, do you want to introduce yourself and yes. your colleagues? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Monifa McKnight, Superintendent. Um, look forward to our interactions this evening, and I am joined here by staff who I will ask to introduce themselves at this time. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. I'm Brian Hall, the Chief Operating Officer. Good evening, everyone. Pat Murphy, Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, I'm Dana Edwards. I'm the Chief of District Operations. Good evening, Rochelle Rubin, Chief of School Support and Wellbeing. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Kara Trenkamp, Director for Digital Innovation. Eric Garcia, Assistant to the Chief of Staff. Good evening, Yvonne Alfonso Windsor, Supervisor of Budget. Hi everyone, Patricia Kapunin, School System Medical Officer. So glad to see you here today. Mr. Stockton. Brian Stockton. Brian Stockton, Chief of Staff. Thank you. The order of speakers is listed on the agenda that is available on the board's website. Written testimony received in advance has also been made available to the public and for board members review on board docs. The board's second hearing on the proposed operating budget is Tuesday, January 17th at 6 p.m. The board's operating budget work sessions will be held at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, January 18th, and on Tuesday, January 24th. We will take tentative action on the proposed operating budget on Thursday, February 23rd during the board's regularly scheduled board meeting. Let's begin with our speakers who are here with us in person. When your name is called, please approach the podium and push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Please speak clearly and directly into the microphone. And our, spur, our first speaker for tonight is Nia Bansal. Please come forward. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Nia Bunsell, and I'm a sophomore at Richard Montgomery. I'm testifying today to urge you to create better support systems for students who are new to Montgomery County. I'm a third culture and trilingual student who has not lived in a country for more than four consecutive years. From living in various parts of Asia and the United States, I've had extremely different ex experiences. When I'm, um, when I'm when moving to Singapore during fifth grade, the school I went to had support systems for new students, including counselor check-ins, a student buddy system, and support groups. When I moved to Montgomery County, however, nothing was available to me. I was simply left to find my classes alone, make new friend groups, and already built friend groups alone, and learn about opportunities in the county alone. This was an unpleasant experience that became detrimental to my mental health and decreased my academic success. Because it is extremely difficult moving to a large county like ours, it is essential to support students who are new to this county. Without support, it is overwhelming for new students to fend for themselves in a new environment. A 2016 study by the American Journal of Preventative Medicine confirms that negative psychological impacts, such as lower self-confidence, depression, and anxiety, can in fact be results of childhood relocations. I'm proposing a few ideas in order to help students adjust to a new school. The first idea is allocating one new counselor for every three schools to work specifically with new students. One of their main jobs should include monthly check-ins with new students during their first year at the school. 
Um, a second idea to support new students is a buddy system. This would include one current student at the new student school helping to guide the student around. This system would allow new students to be properly acquainted with their school and hopefully make some friends through their buddy. A third solution to helping students new to the county is providing every school with funds to create a pamphlet about their school. This pamphlet can be distributed to all new students and simply include information such as a map of the school and important people to, conflict, to contact. By implementing these programs, we will not only be helping the well-being of new students, but also improving their education. When students feel more comfortable in the county and school they are in, they will inevitably feel more comfortable advocating for their education. I understand that the vast majority of students enrolled in MCPS have been here for a long time. However, we need to work to help all students, old and new. I have observed success in the implementation of my proposals at schools I've attended in the past. This is why, once again, I urge you, members of the board, and Dr. McKnight to use a small fraction of the $3 billion budget in order to help support students new to Montgomery County. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you decide to implement these proposals. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Alexander Allen, and I'm a sophomore at Bethesda Cherry Chase High School. Today, I'd like to address the need for easily accessible and up-to-date mental health resources on the MCPS website. One of the easiest ways students can access information about MCPS is through the MCPS website. However, the website is disorganized, and while holding lots of information, it can be hard to find what you're looking for, especially if you're using a phone. Many pages are outdated, have too much information, or aren't helpful and require additional searching for an answer. An example is the mental health resources at the top of each school website. When viewing wellness resources at your school, students are given a list of resources without information on what they are and how to access them. Additionally, MCPS has four links with similar names on the MCPS homepage, which adds confusion as to what information is valuable. I put links to these specific pages in my written testimony. We cannot expect students in search of support to review lengthy, outdated pages of information. With many mental health resources in the recommended $3.2 billion operating budget, I urge MCPS to make it easier to find and understand the resources we have available in MCPS. Students in the Mental Health Committee at my school, BCC, have created a table of resources linked in my written testimony that is clear and easy for students to filter through and has resources for different groups of people like LGBTQ plus youth. It is also imperative to update the MCPS website to show when information was last updated so that students are always accessing the most up-to-date information from MCPS. Simply adding a last updated date would increase, would increase confidence in search results and allow, uh, allow outdated results to be archived and not used. By making mental health resources straightforward for students to access and understand through accurate up-to-date information on the MCPS website, we are ensuring students will remain well in MCPS. Thank you for your time and consideration. Next up is Samantha Ross. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sam Ross, and I'm a sophomore at Montgomery Blair High School and a candidate for the 46th student member of the Board of Education. I'd like to quickly recognize my good friends, Nico, Alex, and Sophie, for their incredible advocacy today. I hear from students almost constantly about what more support they need, what they wish MCPS had, what they wish they knew about upcoming projects, and an ever-growing list of requests for student problems to be fixed. So I'm very happy to see that many of these are addressed in the proposal for the budget, especially bus tracking, employee recruitment, dual enrollment, AP and IB costs being waived, and the expansion of the college tracks program. However, as it stands, I'm worried that we'll see something we see all too often in MCPS, important resources going unused by the students and families who need them because the communication and engagement about the new resources just doesn't reach people. Time and time again, we hear students wish that MCPS wish that it had something it does, but they just don't know about it, either because the information is buried under piles of things that they don't care about, or was never shared in an easy to see and understand manner, especially for students whose primary language is not English. 
In order to make sure that these new developments don't get buried under an ever-growing list of press releases, programs, and resources from MCPS, I asked three simple things. First, that the students are the ones being asked for their opinions and solutions for the rollout and advertisement of these new changes. Second, that MCPS centers the experiences and needs of minority and low-income students who's, who need these resources most, especially those disabled who do not speak English as a primary language, live in the DCC and NEC areas, and are recent arrivals to Maryland and the United States. Finally, the MCPS conducts follow-up focus groups following these rollouts to ensure that they have been properly, properly utilized and advertised. The operating budget has the tr tr opportunity to be a true turning point for MCPS in terms of employee, family, and student outcomes. That will be completely undercut if the introduction of what's in this budget occurs like many students are all too familiar with. They hear about it once and never again, never getting the opportunity to benefit from it. I am very excited to see what's in this proposal, but I request that the attention and allotments are given proper plans for advertisement and awareness of the new resources. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I hope I leave you with the student perspective as a priority. I'd like to wish you all a good night. Up next, Aniko Teoracio. Sorry. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Nico Gerazio, and I'm a current junior at Thomas F. Swoon High School. Today, I'm advocating for the allocation of resources for our district, district's much forgotten textbooks and educational materials. Last year, during my AP Human Geography course, we received a textbook that was over a decade old. It was, it was published in the year that I was born. While much of the coursework was not centered around the textbook, I felt it was appropriate to utilize the textbook to study as a study tool for our tests and ultimately the AP exam. However, when I began reading the book, I found that due to its age, it did not align with the current AP curriculum for the course. Instead, I was forced to purchase my own review book in order to prepare for the test and my final AP exam. This issue is not simply prevalent at Wuhan, but also exists in every school across the county. I hear countless stories of old and dilapidated books from friends at Blair, Northwood, BCC, and more. Students in courses with final exams, such as AP and IB classes, must resort to purchasing study materials when their textbooks cannot suffice to get deficiencies. This is because we cannot simply rely on our in-class instruction, but must also study independently in order to earn passage and college credit earning scores. Material inadequacies Inadequacies not only harm our students' learning and test preparation, but also widen the educational opportunity gap. If a student plans on taking an AP or IB course and does not have access to ed adequate educational materials, such as in-depth course reviews and practice tests, they will be forced to make a choice. The choice between using less than often paid for online materials or purchasing costly exam preparation books for themselves. Thus, when students cannot afford to purchase study materials in place of a textbook, they are placed at a disadvantage to their peers who can. When faced with inadequate materials, students' class and exam grades are placed in jeopardy. Accordingly, these students must work harder to be equally prepared as students in schools with newer materials. I ask that in the FY 2024 operating budget, the board increases funding to provide updated textbooks to every student, no matter what courses they're enrolled in. While financial restraints exist, so too do renditions of textbooks and course material. With sustainability and budgetary constraints in mind, purchasing updated online textbooks for every course will reduce the impact of educational material disparities and hardback book costs. While many teachers have separate teaching styles, I ask that MCPS provide online textbooks as either primary course materials, which teachers may choose to use to instruct if they, search, if they want, or as supplemental resources for students who want access to further explanation on course materials. If this does not occur, students who cannot afford to purchase their own study materials will be placed far at a disadvantage and therefore experience many educational disparities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Up next, we'll hear from Madison Watts. Good evening, Board of Education members and Superintendent Dr. McKnight. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to, te to testify before you tonight. My name is Madison Watts, and I am a sophomore at Rockville High School. I'm active in many activities and organizations, both inside and outside of school. Um, in advocacy capacities. My involvement, I feel, gives me a good perspective on the 
I issues I'd like to discuss today, where budget and resources should be increased. First, the introduction of college and career readiness much earlier in the high school experience than it is currently introduced. Second, the importance of diversifying the instructors and staff in MCPS to include not only diversity in race and gender, but diversity in experience and representing different career fields. As to my first issue, I believe there's not nearly enough exposure to college and career, and career readiness programs right off the bat. In my personal experience, students start to get hyper-focused in these conversations, mainly in their junior and senior years of high school. As a sophomore in high school who is weighing my options for the future, I would like to be advised, but understandably, college and career advisors are occupied with upperclassmen. And this is not only the case for me. Many other students around the county can agree that they are eager to decide what options they can begin thinking about earlier in high school instead of being preoccupied with it only in the last two years of their experience after they may have made critical academic decisions. I would seek additional resources for students in the ninth and 10th grades so that planning and brainstorming can begin earlier in this process. For example, the MCPS Board of Education should fund mandatory assemblies or, pan or panel discussions for high schoolers in all grades, front-loading a larger discussion on what is possible for careers, and then refining those discussions in 10th and 11th grades to allow students to formulate more specific paths. As a county that produces student students that attend some of the top colleges in the nation, it is imperative that we are extending this education early so that all students have the opportunity to succeed in their futures. Secondly, the Board of Education must spend more money on diversifying teachers. Quoting Jill Biden, teaching is not a job, it's a lifestyle. It permeates your whole life. I want to acknowledge that the county's anti-racism audit has been a step in the right direction to begin to establish positive change for students and staff of color. The county executive summary of its anti-racism system audit, specifically domain two, observations 2.3 and 2.4, clearly discusses the need for better workforce diversity. In short, better diversity leads to better engagement from students and allows a larger opportunity to abandon internal biases and stereotypes. If students do not have proper representation and cannot relate to their teachers, their whole learning experience might be impacted. However, if students see instructors who look like them, they might be more inclined to challenge themselves and take initiative. In summation, I am advocating that the Board of Education devotes a portion of the operating budget on college and career readiness information at the 9th and 10th grade levels and designate some of the budget on recruiting, outreach, and hiring a diverse workforce. Thank you so much for your time. Up next, we'll hear from Sophie Wynn. Good evening, members of the Board of Education and Dr. McKnight. First, I would like to thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sophie Nunian, and I'm a sophomore at Rockville High School. As MCB has continued to develop its operating budget, it is clear that we need to prioritize the social, emotional, and academic needs of the students. With that being said, I'm here to support the efforts in removing all of the costs for AP and IB exams. More students are enrolling in AP IB classes each year for a variety of reasons, some of which are that it can help students potentially gain college credit early or that it gives them a glimpse into what courses could be like into the future. Taking these classes is a great way for students to participate in challenging coursework and dive deeper into subjects of their interest. However, there are explanations as to why students may not enroll in these programs, and the main issue is the financial barrier for low-income families. AP exams in particular cost around $97. When considering the amount of courses each student takes on average, if someone took seven AP courses, they would spend nearly $700, which puts more pressure on families who may not have the financial resources to pay it off. It is important to notice that this is excluding the cost of buying review books or other preparation materials. Although the fee waiver option is available and is incredibly helpful for students, including myself, many people do not know that it exists in the first place. And by the time people find out about the fee waivers, the cost of the exams have already piled. In my experience, if my exam fees were not reduced, I would not have been able to take any courses whatsoever. By using a fraction of the budget to cover all of the exam fees, not only would it help thousands of students take the test, but also opens up the opportunity for them to truly explore their interests without the worry of paying thousands of dollars to do so. Everyone deserves the chance to access these resources regardless of their ability to pay. And that starts with eliminating the financial burden and providing support systems to students, ensuring that everyone is learning to their fullest potential every day and every minute. While we explore different avenues in the operating budget, I want to reaffirm that we keep this a priority. Without this, how can we pride ourselves on college and career readiness if we do not remove the barriers to educational equity first? Thank you for your time.
Up next, we have Dr. Jeffrey Johnson from the Community Action Board. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. McKnight, the staff, and all the wonderful people who have attended this board meeting tonight. I'm joined by our executive director, Sharon Strauss. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, and I'm chair of the Montgomery County Community Action Board. The Community Action Board advocates for low-income county residents and serves as the governing body for the Community Action Agency. Our board, along with Head Start Parents Policy Council, also provides governance to the county's Head Start program. Community Action works closely with the Montgomery County Public Schools to ensure that Head Start continues to meet the federal performance standards and continues to serve the needs of children and families in the county. I would like to focus on two main priorities this evening. First, our board remains concerned about the potential impacts of the Blueprint of Maryland's future on early care and education in the county. While we strongly support the expansion of high quality early care and education options, we realize the strain that adding 200 to 300 new pre-K spots will place on the Montgomery County Public Schools and the, the Department of Health and Human Services staff who currently work with the county's Head Start pre-K program. Head Start's federal requirements ensure wraparound services for children and their families, including medical and dental screenings and case management, referrals, and goal setting provided by family service workers. Staff have worked incredibly hard to provide the same critical services for both Head Start and pre-K students. We greatly appreciate the Board of Education's leadership in ensuring that Blueprint funds will be used to hire more family service workers, along with the hiring of new early care and education coordinator who will help to oversee the expansion process. We ask for support in requesting more funding to hire additional nurses so that critical medical services can continue to be available to all Head Start and pre-K students alike. In planning the Blueprint's implementation in the county, our board has continued to advocate for a mixed delivery system that includes both the public schools and private child care providers. Unfortunately, the law's current requirement for certified MSDE teachers poses numerous challenges for family child care providers and private child care centers. We are advocating for revisions to the law that would allow additional certification options, expanded access to degree programs, and alternative options for practicum requirements that would allow providers to meet this requirement in their current employment. We ask the Board of Education support in advocating for these changes. Our second priority is about the need for full day Head Start and pre-K programs. For many years, our board advocated for expanding part day classes to full day programs because we know this is what families need. And because many families who are income eligible for Head Start are served by uh, pre-K. Every year, the part day pre-K classes are the very last programs to reach full enrollment. This is because many families, for many families, it is simply not worth it to enroll a child in a part day program when they have work and other obligations that would make providing childcare outside school hours completely unmanageable. We are thrilled that over the years, most Head Start classes have been transitioned to full day programs. We strongly encourage the Board of Education to explore expanding the remaining part day Head Start and pre-K classes to full day programs as well. 
Thank you for the opportunity to share our priorities with you this evening. We look forward to continue our strong relationship with the Board of Education and the Montgomery County Public Schools. Thanks again. Up next, we'll hear from Sandra Landis. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. It's a pleasure to uh, appear here before you in person and welcome the new members of the board who were recently elected to now take on the important work they were elected to perform. My name is Sandra Landis, and I am the chapter leader of Start School Leader Montgomery County, Maryland, part of a national organization dedicated to ensuring school start times consistent with health, safety, education, and equity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Although the county has invested heavily in wellness centers and high schools to help combat the mental health crisis our students are facing, there is no way to buy ourselves out of this crisis if the structure of our school system is overtly contributing to the mental health problem. Adolescents who get insufficient or poor quality sleep are more likely to report symptoms of depression, hopelessness, suicidal thoughts and attempts, irritability, and impaired emotional regulation. If this isn't concerning enough, sleep deprivation is linked to the two leading causes of death in adolescence, accidents, namely car accidents, and suicide. Several studies demonstrate that adolescent crash rates not only increase significantly in earlier starting high schools, but also decline significantly after delays in school start times are implemented. Other research shows that later bell times help reduce aggression and gun violence. The good news, however, is that we can reverse some of this simply by implementing a bell time change. The other good news is that not all our students act out negatively to express their displeasure with bell times. Several MCPS students have been named to the Start School Later Hall of Fame for their well-written and researched articles published in their school newspapers. However, even the ones who reach out constructively to make their points seem to be ignored on this issue. This county is spending tens of millions of dollars on new curricula. Yet many high school students feel that what they are learning in school bears little to no relevance to the skills they need in their lives. Perhaps the best lesson to teach these students lies not in a textbook, but by having a distinguished body like this model the actions that responsible elected officials should take to apply science to facts to solve a well-documented public health problem that is increasingly life-threatening to them and their communities. At a minimum, it shows them that you care about them, it also shows that you are judicious with your fiscal and other oversight responsibilities and will bring in appropriate experts to develop solutions to known problems. All of the board members who were elected in the recent November 2022 election publicly stated their willingness to undertake a comprehensive transportation study to assess the feasibility of later bell times at a Bethesda Beat Board of Education candidate forum that was recorded for posterity on YouTube. Now that you've won the election to the board, it's time to honor these statements. I'm here tonight to encourage you to fund the comprehensive transportation study by an outside expert to evaluate all our transportation options in order to craft a cost-effective solution. We in Montgomery County, excuse me, <coughs> are fortunate that we have a robust ride-on and metro assets in addition to our fleet of yellow school buses. Further, leveraging public transportation options to our high schools is an equity issue, both for parents who need to attend school meetings but lack transportation, and for students where public transit could potentially augment the shortage of activity buses that precludes some from remaining after school to participate in clubs and other developmentally appropriate activities. Although I am here testifying to include a placeholder for this in the 2024 budget, I believe that our crisis is to the point where the board and MCPS should also commit to using any funds that become available in 2023 to fund such a, such a study. We have staff shortages and many other activities that are planned might cost less than originally budgeted. Such found savings should be applied to conducting a transportation study, which is the key to solving the bell time issue. I also want to be very clear in this testimony because when this issue is discussed, many people react as though we already own the optimal number of school buses and that changing the bell schedule is a zero sum game where one cohort of students needs to compete with another to get the best time slot. 
No one is suggesting flipping elementary and secondary schedules. We believe that it's not safe for any student to be outside in the dark to catch a bus before sunrise. By leveraging all our resources and following the science as we did in our response to COVID, we can better ensure the safety and well-being of our entire school community. Our high schoolers deserve a public school system that prioritizes rather than discriminates against their biologically based developmental needs. High school is the last chance we have to prepare these students for the world. Thank you. Up next, we have Mr. Kevin, Kelvin Brown. Good evening, Board of Education and Dr. McKnight. My name is Kelvin Brown. I'm a school bus driver for West Farm Depot. It's good to see you all again. Given the important importance of a school bus driver's role in, in the skills and responsibilities they have, it is fair to say that school bus drivers deserve to be compensated fairly for their work. This includes receiving a competitive salary that reflects the value they bring to their communities and the challenges they face on the job. In mid-November, we were promised an incentive pay if we continue to double and triple back into schools to get our precious kids to and from school every day. But the school bus drivers were never paid that incentive. A lot of families were banking on that extra money for their own children's Christmas holiday. But that blessing never came. So our children's Christmas was slighted. While we took care of everyone else's children, no one took care of ours. It's a new year and we have yet to see a payment. With last year's budget, a lot of tools were purchased for MCPS. Tools like new electric buses, charging stations, apps for parents and staff. The personnel was not supported. Teachers, school bus, Teachers, school bus operators, and other supporting staff were not properly compensated for their important roles that they, play, that they played in the educational purposes for students. In this new proposal for 2024, it said that $119 million will be allocated for staff. I think it's fair to say that teachers, school bus operators, bus attendants, and other supporting staff deserve a billion dollars out of that new budget. Thank you. We will now take uh, board questions, starting with Ms. Yang. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for all our students who came out to testify. You are very sharp and have identified a lot of questions, uh, issues uh, within our school system. And thank you for the organization um, to come out to testify. I have. Um, two questions. So, um, textbook is mentioned in one of the testimonies. So, can someone um, in the system, doesn't have to be today, but tell me what is our procedures of updating textbooks for our students? Uh, how is that done um, in our system? I will appreciate that. And Mr. Brown mentioned an incentive. And if someone can let us know what incentive and that is and that's scheduled to be paid, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So why don't I st Nikki, are you going to? Do you want me to respond? Why don't I start with the incentive? We work backwards and then you all can address the textbook um, situation. So, um, Mr. Brown, a uh, very compelling um, story that you share with us, and you're right. We worked really hard to make sure we had that incentive because we were at a very difficult squeeze moment, I would say, in which we know that we needed our drivers to go back and do the runs. Um, we did work with SEIU to have that sign so that we could have that incentive provided um, to you all. We will address exactly why um, 
you all did not receive the incentive. We, signed, we, we did that at the end of November. You are absolutely correct. Um, I know we can't go back to what, what has happened last month, particularly around the holidays, and I apologize for that, but I will tell you that we will fix it. Thank you. Um, Nikki? Okay, good evening. Nikki Hazel, Associate Superintendent in Curriculum and Instructional Programs. Thank you, Nico, for uh, sharing your testimony. Um, we do have a policy where we do revisit textbooks, textbook use every five to seven years, and so we do want to make sure those are updated. I have asked my team to take a look and see, um, you know, do a survey of what textbooks we have outstanding that's very old, what you described, and so certainly we don't want to have those in our schools. We want to make sure we have the most updated version, so we'll look into that. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Uh, yeah, I just want to thank, I found all of the testimony so far, just very uniquely constructive. Everybody coming forward with really um, substantive ideas for improvement based on their lived experience of our school system, and that's how we get better. Um, in pr and I wish, uh, I think Ms. Bonsall, our first um, uh, person to provide testimony left, and I, I'm sorry she did, because um, she felt she provided some very real world constructive um, ideas for how we can do a better job of just welcoming new students into a building, where they're, whether they're coming from outside the country, outside the county, um, it, it doesn't matter. Your first time in one of our schools is, can be, I'm sure, overwhelming. And her, her three ideas to help make that experience an easier, uh, less stressful one, I think we're all quite good. And if we, you know, I, you know, good idea is a good idea, and if we could reach out to her at RM, she said she's a 10th grader at RM, and maybe close that gap on some of her ideas. Um, and I, uh, Mr. Allen from BCC also, if we could take a look at the, re the student created resource that's being circulated at BCC, which clearly provides very useful information to students about resources available, and see if that's a scalable model that we can share widely through our communications team, um, get that information out to other uh, our other 25 high schools so that they have a very useful resource for students. Um, and um, one thing that uh, Mr. Drazio also mentioned, closing the opportunity gap, and I, I, I think it is a cost savings, as he, I think, mentioned, is the looking into of converting some of our textbook use, or at least part of our textbook inventory, to the online versions which are um, certainly you don't have the attrition due to damage. I know as a former teacher who had, you know, hard copy textbooks that we used, um, you know, even as careful as the students are, there's a lot of wear and tear, but there's not wear and tear of an, electric, of, of an electronic textbook. And it's also um, something that doesn't rely on a student to remember it, carry it back and forth, um, keep track of it. But it's a resource that's always available, which is an equity issue, as he pointed out. Um, and I, I'm glad a lot of these students are picking up on things that we are planning to do. They're paying attention to the blueprint and our new obligation to cover those costs for <coughs> courses, for course fees and, and, and test fees. So thank you for keeping your eye on that. And what I think they highlighted for us is it doesn't matter if there's a really great opportunity there if students and families don't know about it. So the students, the customers, are the ones who can tell us if we're sharing information effectively or not. And I thought their idea was a great one to get help have students be part of your, your communications development team and also pilot testing and reviewing the communications that go out for effectiveness. Um, because again, they're, they're our target audience. So anyway, thank you very much for all of this constructive testimony. I think this is what's gonna make us a better system. Ms. Rebecca Alvin. Thank you. I just want to say how um, um, Sorry to see impacted I am by the students, um, by your testimony. And um, so a couple of things that I would like us to, to look into. I'm wondering if we do have anything for new students when they come in, especially through uh, students who don't speak English so well through Rocking Horse, if there is like a welcoming package with um, 
all the information about their new school with a map, if we have it in different languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is any program or any uh, buddy system where these students go to a school, if that exists in any schools, I would like to know about it and see how we can duplicate that around the county. Um, we heard very clearly about the mental health component of our students and where this is very much needed. Um, and with COVID and everything else that is going on, I think it takes a strain, uh, especially when you go to a new school to acclimatate and, um, and just make new friends. Um, it's not an easy thing. So I would like us to look into that. Um, I also um, would like to know if um, we have, I don't know if we have any guidelines or policies on uh, outdated material. If we do, if we don't, maybe that is something that we need to look at for the future. Um, and uh, the exposure to career paths. I, we hear you loud and clear, and I think you're going to like uh, Dr. My Knight's plan that is coming down the pike for those students. I'm actually a believer that we should start that in middle school, um, by the way. Um, and um, also the, the cost for AP classes and IV classes, I, I hear you a lot um, as well, Ms. Guyen. I know many students where this is a hardship um, when you have more than one child. As a mom who had a son who did a lot of AP, I know how it is, and we had to get a, extra books and so on for him to prepare. So the burden is there. You know, we are in tough economic times, so anything. So again, I think you're going to like Dr. Mike Knight's plan that is coming down the pike to alleviate that. Um, and the last thing I would like to say is, uh, Mr. Brown, I think you got a positive answer uh, on that. I'm so sorry during the holidays. I know personally, working with families, how difficult the holidays were for many, many families in our community. So I'm glad that that's going to be resolved. Um, and lastly, I'm just wondering with the with Dr. Jeffrey's um, uh, testimony, I'm just wondering uh, that 200, 300 student increase that you said that might have a strain on the system that you think is already uh, doing more with less, where we see a lot, as, as you know, nurses is not something that is easy to find right now. Um, and, and many folks are, are, are looking for more nurses, specialty nurses and so on. Um, but I'm just wondering um, how the blueprint is going to affect that and the all day head start um, as well. That is something that I know uh, you folks and many others have been advocating for years to be implemented um, if there is a plan for that as well. Thank you. Ms. Wolf. I, ju <clears throat> I just want to thank all of our students for coming out tonight. I want to um, reiterate what Ms. Harris said. You had a lot of good ideas, a lot of productive testimony tonight. I also wanted to note as Ms. Um, Oven did, Ms. Watts, you're going to be a lot happier when you hear Dr. McKnight's plan. I, too, am a big believer that we should be starting career discussions in middle school. I think it's been very important for our career technical people, too, to start thinking about things in middle school. A lot of the other things I wanted to talk about have already been covered, so I'm going to skip that. I'd also like to say to Mr. Brown, I'm really sorry about that. Um, last time I saw you, we were talking about that. So we will look into that and get that straightened out. Thank you. Ms. Madrowski? Yep. Um, so pretty much everything's already been said. So I'm just going to say um, thank you to everybody for coming out and testifying. Um, students, you've blown me away tonight. Fantastic job. Um, your advocacy for not just your own issues, but looking at what every child needs is beyond impressive, so thank you. Um, Ms. Watts, you read my mind in terms of the uh, career stuff. Um, we had a meeting yesterday, uh, a work session, and I mentioned multiple times about the idea of starting in middle school for um, our students to get an opportunity to plan out their, their high school careers. <clears throat> so I appreciate that um, advocacy very much. 
Um, I, too, have questions about the textbooks and whether or not we actually currently have Ms. Hazel online textbooks. Um, you know, one of the points that was raised um, it brought me back to a couple of years ago when um, we were talking about the benefits um, with Dr. Smith about students participating in AP classes, even if they don't pass the test, but some of the discrepancies between students who do well in the course and don't pass the test, and whether or not that has any um, effect based on what kind of resources they have available beyond what they get in the classroom. So um, you can, I know you've already touched on it a little bit. I don't know if we have any online, but if we don't, we definitely need them, obviously. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, but. Yes, I'm looking into it to determine what we have online and what we still have hard copy. We do, if, if anything is still in textbook form, it's probably outdated at this point, so yeah. we need to look into online options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. But even beyond just um, the textbooks, the extra resources that are available to some students at a cost that others just can't afford would be amazing. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to say, um, as a follow-up to Mr. Brown's uh, testimony makes me a little heartbroken. <laughs> um, I appreciate that, um, Dr. McKnight, you said you would follow up with them, but if you could make sure that we all get information about that as well, I'd be very appreciative for that. By tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask. Um, oh. Well, if you have a question. Yeah, just I'll, I'll get you next. Um, Ms. Landis, could you please send us um, what you mean by a comprehensive transportation yes. study? I know that Dr. McKnight has been working with our county leaders to really evaluate transportation because of the challenges that we've had. And um, I just want to better understand what you're, you have in mind, how that relates to what we're already doing, and if that fits into a budget discussion or not. So thank you. Mr. Kim? Thank you. Yeah, just include that, include that in your communication. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to speak a little bit more about a point that's been uh, raised again now, um, but especially over the past few months, we've seen uh, the school system develop such a wealth uh, of really valuable mental health resources that, that I think uh, within lie a, a lot of benefits that students have access to. Uh, but the truth is that, that even now, um, few students, I think, are really in tune with how to access those resources, that those resources ex exist. Uh, but even the students that, and this is uh, my newest kind of understanding, even the students that do uh, are aware of these resources and know they exist, don't really fully understand them. Yes, my school has a wellness center, but what is a wellness center? Um, yes, my school is a social worker, and uh, I'm aware of the school psychologist, but what is really uh, the role that they play? How can I access them as systems of support? Um, so I, I think that's an area um, that we need to continue to work on and continue to, to uh, explore in terms of how to, to make students um, aware and ready to access these resources that we continue to invest in, and of course are important, uh, so we want to make sure that that foundation is there. Uh, I had the, the great pleasure of spending some time at Einstein High School this morning, um, and, and I think that they've done a fantastic job of really ingraining uh, mental health resources and social emotional learning into the school day. It seems like um, the student network is, is really tapped into to those resources and aware, uh, and I think a part of that has really rooted in a, a more localized approach to communication. Uh, so as much as, as we can sit at the table and speak to the importance uh, of publishing these resources, um, you know, every student needs to know where in my building can I go um, to access uh, these resources. What does my social worker look like? What does my school psychologist look like? Um, so really building that there um, and, and just also another, I think, uh, fruitful approach um, that I saw was understanding that social emotional learning is not something, um, an appendix to the school day. It's baked into to every part of uh, education. Um, and, and I think that these approaches are ultimately gonna build a culture where students are more prepared, ready, and aware uh, to access these mental health resources um, and, and more prepared to, to uh, tackle the school day as a whole. So I uh, just wanted to raise those points. Thank you, Mr. Kim. 
Let's continue now uh, with Debbie Orsak. Oh, sorry. sorry I have one more question. I apologize for forgetting. Uh, Ms. Ms. Landis's uh, start time earlier. Um, I'm, I'm very much interested and intrigued by the public health aspects of this, and I just sit, I'm sitting here reflecting. We have a health officer who has public health expertise, and as we move into the school year, we, where we are budgeting for the but long overdue, in my opinion, bus tracking software, which will help us find and identify route efficiencies, which can help us with our transportation challenges in many ways. But one of them may be, you know, looking at how um, that software can be a tool in helping us really seriously look at the issue of school start times, along with the guidance of our health officer when we look at the <coughs> true uh, public health impacts of um, early versus late start times, especially for our adolescents. So thank you very much. Ms. Orsak. <coughs> OK, sorry, I'm a little bit taller. Good evening, President Silvestri, Vice President Evans, members of the board, Dr. McKnight, and MCPS and board staff. It is a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. I'm Debbie Orsak, the president of MCCPTA. But more importantly, I am the mother of three MCPS graduates and one current MCPS student. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on behalf of all the PTSA communities in MCPS. That's parents, teachers, and students. And before I begin, I want to commend and thank all of our students who testified already tonight. Our children are so intelligent, and they are our bright stars for the future. Thank you. So now, I would like to begin my testimony by reaffirming the mission of all PTAs, which is what we do before all of our MCCPTA meetings, to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Now, I come to you tonight in support of the superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2024 operating budget and its focus on students, classrooms, and schools. We are blessed to be a part of a community that believes in the benefits of quality education and understands that that comes at a cost. We know that that cost is worth the value it provides to our children and our community at large. There are many issues our children, teachers, parents, and communities are facing these days, some of which they were facing well before the pandemic. And we need to make sure that we continue to work for our schools and communities and keep our efforts broad enough to address as many issues as we can, and we need to work together on them. As we are all aware, we are a very large and diverse school system, which proves to be very challenging with so many varied needs. This budget works to address the varied needs while staying centered on supporting all of our students, accelerating learning, and enhancing innovative approaches to recovering from the pandemic. Although many of us would like to put the pandemic behind us, our children are still very much trying to recover educationally, emotionally, and socially. And we must be there to help and guide and support them. We must recognize that many, if not most of our students that were in school during full-time virtual learning are not at the same level of academic knowledge as the students that came before them. Many, if not most of them, are not at the same level of emotional and social skills as the students that came before them. Now, while it is imperative to address the learning loss that affected most students, it is also imperative that we keep pushing our students as we did before to reach our accelerated learning opportunities. We must ensure that the opportunities for reaching higher are available for all of our students. We were fortunate to receive ESSER funds to help pay for our programs and resources, but the ESSER funds are ending, and we need to ensure that the benefits gained from these programs and resources implemented with those funds continue. But we also must ensure that we have evaluation frameworks in place so that we can determine what is working and needs to be kept and what is not working and needs to be retooled or replaced. Being a product of MCPS myself, having graduated from Wooten High School, Nico, I have always appreciated the benefits of an MCPS education, which is why my husband and I made the decision to raise our four children in Montgomery County and have them attend MCPS schools. I've been involved with MCCPTA for over 20 years, and I'm very proud that MCCPTA and MCPS are working together to rebuild the trust that we need to support our children. We are rebuilding the working partnerships at the grassroots level that helps us advocate for the needs and wants of all our communities. Over these two nights of testimony, you are going to hear from parents and students from our various clusters and schools about the needs and issues that are important to their communities. I know that you will listen 
and take all of their testimony into consideration as you discuss and vote on the budget. Yes, it is a lot of money, but our kids are worth it. So I would like to end with our national PTA motto, which has been our motto since 1897. No, I was not around then. Every child, one voice. Cada niño, una sola voz. Thank you for listening. Up next, we'll hear from Amy Ackerberg Hastings. Good evening, President Sylvester and the Board of Education, Dr. McKnight and MCPS staff. My name is Amy Ackerberg Hastings. I serve MCCPTA as one of this year's Richard Montgomery Cluster Coordinators, and I am the parent of a Richard Montgomery High School ninth grader. I'll start with a few of the things we are celebrating in our schools. The establishment of the Community Schools Program at Twinbrook Elementary School, the creation of the Bridge to Wellness Program at Richard Montgomery High School, the provision of full-time staff development teachers throughout the cluster, and the professional excellence of our principals. Our cluster's testimony on the fiscal year 2024 operating budget is grouped into five priority areas. The written version of the testimony contains additional details. First, staffing is interwoven with educating the whole child. Yet, high staff to student ratios in several job categories pose risks to physical and emotional safety such as security staff, which is at um, a ratio of one to 400 students at Richard Montgomery High School, lunch and recess aides, which are at a ratio of one to 50 in our elementary schools, and psychologists and counselors, which are roughly one to 500 at the elementary level. Meanwhile, MCPS's approach to class size impacts learning and well-being, especially at the elementary level. In practice, a school cannot request additional teachers until every class in the grade has at least one student above the maximum class size and one class in the grade exceeds the maximum by at least two students. Effectively addressing the multiple levels of need that exist in every classroom is challenging enough without layering on situations in which a kindergarten class may have as many as 26 students and a fourth or fifth grade class may have as many as 30 students. We urge the board to require MCPS to provide additional staffing as soon as one class in a grade exceeds the maximum. Our second topic is curriculum implementation. We are enthusiastic about MCPS's enriched literacy curriculum, which provides advanced rigorous instruction to fourth and fifth grade students and is delivered through their home schools. However, next year's expansion to the entire county will apparently include only fourth grade students. We urge the board to direct MCPS to implement ELC in both fourth and fifth grade classrooms in fall 2023. We realize that the rollout of the Leader in Me social and emotional learning curriculum is still underway, but we are concerned about the apparent lack of training and oversight provided to schools to date. A particular gap noted by Julius West Middle School is with the students whose mental health needs fall in between those for whom daily advisory classes suffice and those who require one-to-one -one support through the um, length of a severe crisis. We support MCPS's recent commitment to increase the robustness with which the Holocaust and anti-Semitism are discussed in classes, and we encourage MCPS to formally incorporate efforts to combat anti-Semitism into implementation of the anti-racist system audit. We also continue to encourage MCPS to fully build out the potential for virtual learning to provide courses that otherwise would not be available at every school. Third, we share a few thoughts on technological tools. For instance, we are looking forward to finally seeing the bus tracking app and other ongoing technology improvements that provide real-time communication with families. We request that the position of Chief Technology Officer be restored to MCPS's organizational structure. And as we have said before, questions about appropriate uses of technology intersect with equity issues. For example, insistence on school cash online as the only payment option for families requires them to pay additional fees on every transaction. Fourth, the mindful stewardship of MCPS's human resources is essential. 
Several strategies for retaining MCPS's excellent teachers and staff are listed in our written testimony, including providing financial support for pursuing certification and degrees in special education and or world languages, promoting collaborations with teachers in similar schools and school districts, so that, for example, IB middle years programs can engage with innovative teaching, learning, and grading practices, and issuing MCPS cell phones to assistant principals. Finally, we advocate for less rigidity in responding to changing enrollment conditions. Every year, Bayard Ruston Elementary School experiences significant late enrollment, which leaves it with large class sizes and overutilized classrooms. Our acting director for school support and well-being has recommended that enrollment be projected based on previous patterns in order to break this catch-22, and we support this approach. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to your action. Up next, we have Kim Glassman. Good evening, Dr. Big Knight and members of the board. My name is Kim Glassman, and I serve as one of the Magruder Cluster coordinators and parent of three MCPS students. The Magruder Cluster is one with growing needs. We are a smaller cluster, but our size does not diminish what our community needs. We have an increased number of students who are farms eligible, who are English language learners, and our cluster is home to many discrete special education programs. As the number of students and families requiring support grows, so do our budgetary and staffing needs. Our students show increasing mental health concerns, including our youngest learners, and academic deficits lingering from the year of virtual instruction. We strongly believe that the operating budget must prioritize these needs, knowing that the degree of impact in our community rises. Staffing. The staffing issue is significant on our cluster, and these challenges do not change what our students need. There continue to be significant shortages impacting our schools. Staff must go beyond the call of duty daily, including using their planning time without adequate pay to cover classes. Special education vacancies are extremely impactful. Our special educators have increased caseloads on top of teaching responsibilities, and support staff positions have become hard to fill. We again request necessary staffing throughout the cluster to provide our students what they need, including mental health staff down to our youngest learners. MCPS should work collaboratively with volunteers and community partners to bring academic and mental health support during the school day to our students. MCPS used to be the most sought after district to teach in and our reputation has declined. We've seen our teachers leave for neighboring school systems. Our staff need appropriate salaries, benefits, professional development, and planning time to do their jobs effectively. Our students and staff have continued to experience growing mental health needs. We continue to recommend systemic screenings for all students to provide appropriate intervention and referrals. We request expanding the use of school-based social workers throughout our cluster, and Flower Hill specifically needs additional counseling staff as our farms population is approaching 70%. Magruder houses one of two enhanced social emotional special education programs in the county. These students struggle with anxiety, depression, and school refusal. We are requesting that they have flexible transportation provided by MCPS so they can arrive to school late and still benefit from their academic instruction. Though we do not have any Title I or community schools, our cluster schools have taken on food distribution, clothing distribution, gift card distribution, and other supports for our families. Given the diversity of our cluster, we must ensure that there are structures in place for outreach to underrepresented and non-English speaking communities. We request the addition of dedicated parent and community coordinators for these efforts. Curriculum support. Our students have benefited from the move to structured literacy with our youngest learners benefiting the most. Our oldest students did not have the benefit of structured liter literacy during their foundational learning years and have continued to have deficits in their reading skills as, as evident from the statewide MCAP data. Our upper elementary and secondary students need these skills infused into the curriculum without requiring a student to be identified as in need of literacy <laughs> intervention. Our students also continue to have gaps in math skills, and that is even more abysmal in the statewide math data. We ask that MCPS can uh, focus on ensuring that our students are taught and retaught the skills they missed out during the virtual year, and emphasis be filled, uh, put on filling academic gaps. Uh, for our AP students, there's been a 
increase in the number of students taking AP exams and a decrease in the number of students achieving a three or higher. There needs to be a better way to help these students. I would echo the students who testified earlier about access to books, tutoring, and instructional materials to ensure that they can access and be successful on AP exams. It is not enough to just have the fees waived. Summer school programming. As our students continue to struggle and academic gaps persist from the year of virtual instruction, we request that MCPS continue no-cost, robust summer school programming. MCPS should partner with Montgomery County Department of Recreation and other third-party providers to fill a full workday of summer programming in single locations, especially at the elementary school. Even with transportation provided, it is a barrier to children for participating if there is not a place for them to go after 1 p.m. Our parents are simply at work. Strategic planning so they are housed in elementary schools will allow more equitable access to summer school programming. Thank you for your time, and the Magruder Cluster looks forward to working with you to build a stronger future for our students. Up next, we'll hear from Stephanie Fitz. One more time. Hi, my name is Stephanie Fitz, and I am, I guess, the sole Quince Orchard Cluster Coordinator. I want to start by thanking Dr. McKnight for her earlier Zoom budget presentations. I really needed them. I also want to thank the MCPS staff who gave their time on Saturday morning during the super helpful budget workshop. That was amazing. In my cluster, parents have repeatedly expressed concern with 504 plan oversight and guidance counselor overload. To address these issues, I want to strongly support retaining the full funding for the creation of the 504 plan coordinator position, as well as the two 504 plan instructional specialist positions. These positions will help build the critical scaffolding to support overworked counselors, especially those counselors at high schools. The first concern with 504 plans that parents have addressed that I want to address is the lack of uniformity in how they're administered. For instance, at some NCPS schools, students with 504 plans who are transitioning from 5th to 6th grade or 8th to 9th grade meet with guidance counselors at their new schools prior to the start of the school year. This allows the guidance counselors at the new school and the old school to work together to ensure a smooth transition so that student enters their new school already knowing how to access needed accommodations and with these accommodations in place. Other schools do not do this. Lack of planning for a transition put these students at a disadvantage since they must muddle through sorting how to access their accommodations at the same time as figuring out the logistics of their new school. When these plans are not in place, students must spend their first weeks of school advocating for their needs and educating teachers about their disabilities when time could be spent learning. Having more dedicated staff, as called it for in the SAP, will help oversee the 504 plan process and MCPS as a whole. The next issue that comes up often is how students' accommodations are communicated to classroom teachers at the start of the school year. In some instances, guidance counselors are reaching out with real information and insights into the necessary accommodations for students with 504 plans. In other instances, guidance counselors leave it to teachers to notice and then read the students' plans and make sense of accommodations on their own. This obviously results in equities for how these students experience the first weeks of school. The most egregious example I have of this, due to privacy, I'm only going to mention my own child. Um, some other parents aren't, you know, it's a sensitive issue, is a teacher not knowing on the first few weeks of school he had hearing loss throughout the first few weeks of instruction. And when he informed this teacher of his disability and requested his accommodations, the teacher asked if his hearing loss was in his 504 plan. In another example, a different teacher assumed my son's preferential seating was due to ADHD, which he does not have, and then approached my son about his ADHD needs. This is in no way a rare occurrence for parents and students in my community. Many students with 504 plans experience teachers not knowing vital aspects of their plans. What this means to me is that teachers really, really, really need a Cliff Notes version of accommodations provided for them at the start of the school year, when they are busily attempting to sort all the new school year logistics. As a side note, many parents of kids with 504 plans know to email teachers at the start of the school year to ensure their children receive accommodation just in case the guidance counselor does not do this. This situation is patently inequitable 
since it benefits only students whose parents are comfortable with technology and with communicating in English and are in the know enough to be aware to email teachers at the start of each school year. To level the playing field, schools, not parents, should ensure teachers are aware of 504 accommodations. My next 504 concern has to do with professional training for teachers so that they better understand the disabilities of students in their class. Again, putting my son out there. Knowing a child has hearing loss is not the same as understanding a bit about hearing loss and how it impacts the student. In another instance, knowing a student has a 504 plan due to clinical and depression and anxiety does not help that teacher understand the impact of these conditions on the student. Likewise, for students with chronic illness, other mental health conditions, impaired vision, and so on. My hope would be with the new, two new instructional specialists for 504 plans, more professional training could be given to teachers around disability awareness without being more of a burden on guidance. This brings me to guidance. There's many, many, many wonderful guidance counselors and MCPS working daily to support the just staggeringly increased needs of students. But even the best guidance counselor only has so many hours in the day to dedicate. To summarize what I say next is parents in my cluster are uniformly concerned that they are simply not having emails returned from guidance. You send emails, there are no responses. You call, the responses are late, and when students try to access their guidance counselors, they are turned away. That's dangerous. Thank you. There's more in my notes. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Henry St. Gerard. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Amir St. Gerard. I am a co-cluster coordinator for the Sherwood Cluster and uh, the Northeast Consortium AVP. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. The Sherwood Cluster and Northeast Consortium schools have both programmatic and staffing needs that I'm happy to see addressed in the recommended budget. Specifically, our schools and students, especially in our underrepresented and marginalized communities, continue to need support and response to learning loss and mental health needs because of COVID. Last year, I came before you and commended MCPS for wisely using ESSER funds to stand up and support summer school, tutoring, mental health services, and the Montgomery Virtual Academy. I also suggested that MCPS consider long-term planning to incorporate budget requests for these and other programs funded by these one-time federal funds. With the ESSER funding set to end, now is the time to identify what programs work and how to request the proper funding to continue these projects. While I'm happy to see the recommended budget contains funds to continue tutoring services and a virtual academy, I do not see funding requests to continue the summer programs beyond the use of ESSER money. I do hope that some form of the summer program uh, continues after ESSER, and I request that you clarify this in your submission and or address it accordingly with explaining the fiscal cliff that is anticipated at the end of the federal funding. Since the return to in-person learning, many families in the cluster schools I work with are dealing with school bus delays and unreliable bus scheduling. I'm happy to see that the FY24 recommended budget contains a request for funding to support the implementation of a system-wide software program to inform families on the status of bus routes in real time, along with leveraging data to identify ways to maximize bus uses and routes. Both will go a long way to ensure families are kept abreast of where their children are and provide MCPS with the data points to make informed decisions on bus routes usage. Excuse me. My only recommendation is that the scope of work for the task remain wide so as to ensure that all options and features of this new system are considered and evaluated accordingly. Finally, I want to acknowledge the funding requests for additional FTEs to address HVAC issues throughout our county schools. I have come before you at capital request hearings to address these maintenance needs and I'm happy to see the dedicated investment for more FTEs. My hope is that this request in, is results in quicker response times to fix HVAC issues along with additional resources to identify and respond to larger projects required at some of our schools. I thank you for the time to offering me this platform to share the thoughts and concerns of the Sherwood Cluster and the Northeast Consortium Schools. 
I want to emphasize and stress that your recommendations and decisions are viewed through an equity lens that ensures all our students and schools are provided with adequate resources to succeed and strive. I also want to note that you please listen to the concerns and needs of our parents and families regarding special education program. I cannot speak to if there is or isn't adequate funding in this recommended budget for special education program. And in turn, I ask that you listen intently to my fellow cluster coordinators and parent volunteers who are more knowledgeable and have direct experience in this space. I'm also speaking to my co, um, for my co-cluster coordinator who has uh, experience and knowledge in this area, uh, not only through her just working through the system, but also because her kids uh, are in special needs programming. So I want to make note, I'd be remiss to not mention that. Uh, so I please ask you to uh, focus on that as well and listen to our families just like you heard uh, earlier. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Up next, we have Nicholas Basie. Yes. Greetings. I'm Nicholas Bassey, Paint Branch Cluster co-coordinator and proud Cloverly Elementary parent. This testimony was crafted in consultation with leaders from Burtonsville, Cloverly, Fairland, Galway, Greencastle, and William Tyler Page Elementary Schools, Benjamin Banneker and Briggs Cheney Middle Schools, and Paint Branch High School. We are proud of recent achievements in our increasingly diverse part of the county, especially but not limited to the selection of multiple posse scholars among our high school seniors. As you might recall from my CIP testimony two months ago, our cluster has two central priorities. Number one, ensuring the physical and emotional safety of our students, and number two, securing the resources and support needed to find and keep high-performing teachers and staff. With hundreds of students per school, or thousands in the case of Paint Branch, current mental health support is inadequate. It is clear that student needs have only increased in complexity following our return to in-person instruction. As I have requested before, we need mental health personnel to help our students to proactively address their issues. I mentioned last year that Greencastle Elementary, for example, has two counselors, and they serve 715 students. And this ratio far eclipses the American School Counselor Association's recommended 250 to one ratio. Further, their sole school psychologist still is only able to visit once per week because she works across three schools, focusing only on tasks like testing for, creating, monitoring, and meeting about IEPs, rather than addressing wider social emotional needs. This reality, unfortunately, is not unique to Greencastle. From a physical safety perspective, we are still disheartened that even after multiple elementary school shootings across this country, including just last week in Virginia, our elementary schools have no dedicated security. The urgency around security after Sandy Hook and Uvalde seems to have waned, and we're still vulnerable as a result. As I said last year, we're not requesting police in our elementary schools. We are instead requesting a consistent approach to securing full-time personnel to monitor school cameras, to help morning and afternoon traffic jams, de-escalate traffic-related conflicts, and deter unwelcome campus visitors. The need for security personnel and additional crossing guards to support student safety came up in conversations within all of our clusters, middle and elementary schools. Now, despite our amazing staff, shortages still make it harder for us to achieve the MCPS mission and vision. We need more school psychologists, instructional specialists, and paraeducators, especially to support members of our community who have special needs. MCPS must prioritize attracting and retaining top talent that would otherwise go elsewhere. It is also clear that these needs are not new. Similar staffing requests have been made by my predecessors since at least 2016. Please partner with us to address these historical issues. We also echo our request for support beyond teachers assigned to specific in-classroom roles. We need math coaches to assist students who fall behind and to provide more challenging assignments for students who excel. We need speech therapists to assist students with identified special needs, as well as help those with similar issues elsewhere in the student body. We need literacy coaches to assist ESOL and other students to gain greater proficiency in English and language arts. Now, in addition to these core themes, I'll run through a few school-specific priorities. For Burtonsville Elementary, it's filling vacancies so that they can be fully staffed. For Cloverly, it's ensuring that there is adequate staffing support and wraparound support for emerging multilingual learners and their family, families. For Finland, it's staffing and equipment to monitor and ensure 
safety, and security. Galway is filling multiple vacancies and finding a permanent solution to the communications dead zones that still exist on their lower levels. That's a clear security issue. For Greencastle, as I mentioned, it's securing mental, securing mental health professionals adequate for the well-being of all students. For Page Elementary, it's securing staff to administer mandatory testing, as well as adequate support for their language immersion program, including paraeducators. For middle, middle schools, Banneker needs staffing and equipment to monitor and ensure student safety and security. Briggs Cheney, it's supporting a level of building support services appropriate for their nearly 1,000 students, not just the square footage of their building as dictated by MCPS formula. For Paint Branch, it's prioritizing additional security personnel. Now, we recognize the fin financial constraints that you face in allocating this uh, MCPS operating budget. Despite these constraints, we urge you to allocate an appropriate share to the Paint Branch Cluster's critical needs as outlined in this testimony. Thank you again for your time, attention, and partnership. We will now take uh, board member questions starting on this side. Uh, if you have a question, please turn on your lights. Ms. Rivera Oven. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who testified. I do have a um, couple of questions. Um, with the 504 plan, I wonder if, because I had to go through this many, many years ago, and it was not an easy way to navigate, and now everything's online. So it's probably even harder for some of our families. But do we have um, something like a cliff note on the 504 plans that is shared with staff? Um, yes, we actually do, and I appreciate it to Ms. Fisk's um, testimony. What you see in our budget is our attempt to really build out the 504 program in Montgomery County with the addition of the instructional specialists. So we do have that cliff notes. What we're looking to do is to get to the level of professional learning that we can scale across all of our schools. Okay, that was my next question, if we actually had any actual training. So that's on the works. Yes, that training does come out of the student services um, office and out of the counselor unit. And that office consists of three individuals currently, and they do that across all 210 of our schools. Um, there was also, trying to think who testify about um, that pretty much the only way to make payments to MCPS is online. Uh, that is, uh, I think it was, again, I think it was Mrs. De uh, and Mrs. Debbie Osek, I think, I believe, who testified. Uh, oh, thank you. Who testified that it was pretty much everything online. Is that, is that a true statement? I'm just asking the staff if that's correct. That is the only way that. It, it is not correct. Okay. Then. So, so somebody can actually pay with a check and cash. and cash. Yep. Okay, and this this is uh, this is notice. It, it, like all parents know that this is. Is there like is this a preferable message that you guys want to you know to have people pay online or is it? But if folks don't have that, because that is that is an equity issue. So we incur. So we encourage um, we encourage payment by credit card because uh, it reduces the amount of cash handling of, of petty cash in schools, which you know comes with all kinds of uh, challenges. Um, but anyone is able to pay using a credit card, cash, or check uh, at the schools. We have a work group currently that is working on this uh, and working on how they can communicate this out better. The working group includes uh, school-based staff uh, and staff from the finance department. And so um, I will follow up and see where in that process we are, but they are working on making sure that that is clearly communicated out, that all forms of, even though we encourage credit card, all forms of payment are accepted. Thank you so much. I, I just have one um, comment question. And that is the lack of response when somebody emails the school 
they should expect a response and they should get a response. Communication is one of our strategic priorities. So I'm hoping that we can get out some sort of communication to remind people that this is important and that parents are, are awaiting an answer, something. Absolutely. Last year, we put out some communication. The expectation is that the school communicates anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. That's consistently been our expectation in Montgomery County Public Schools, and we will issue that reminder. And I want to thank everybody who just testified. We've heard a lot of these same issues over the years, and we are hopeful that the budget will address some. We know that it won't address all, but we did hear you, and we will look at that. Thank you. Dr. Murphy. And Dr. Uh, Ms. Wolf and Ms. Pitts, if you would please follow up with me at the end of uh, this evening. I do want to follow up with you on that uh, communication issue at your school, please. Is your mic not working? Ms. Majoski? It's not working. Okay, can you, uh, let's do the, uh, go ahead. Me? Yeah. Okay. I think your mic's on, that's why the other. Okay. That last um, one is, can you turn the last one off? It looks like you have two mics on. Oh, I don't, I didn't turn that one off. <laughs> it's automatic. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for MCC, PTA, um, and all the cluster who came out tonight. Um, you are advocating for all students and very consistently, you all have highlighted issues such as the importance of we have an evaluation framework for our programs. You all highlighted the staffing and the retention issues uh, in our school system, and that is also one of our strategic uh, plan um, area that we are working on. And I think uh, we know that Montgomery County is, we face challenges, even though it's not unique, but there are things we can do. And we are the most expensive county to live uh, within Maryland, state of Maryland. Yet our teachers' uh, starting salary is number fifth in the state of Maryland. So we, there are things we need to do. And we have mentioned a lot about the Grow Your Own program um, within our school system. So I'm, I know that we have upcoming work sessions for the board, and I would like to see in our budget if that is reflected so that we can um, uh, grow and expand that program uh, for our future employees. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Majowski? Yep, so I too want to thank everybody again for all of your uh, testimony. Um, and one of my colleagues mentioned about how when you've done this for a few years, you start to see reoccurring themes um, sometimes over time. And I was sitting here reflecting how funny it seems that all that's old seems new again sometimes. Um, I would like to ask that um, everybody who's testified, please make sure that we have a copy of your testimony. I personally like to print them out and review them and, and save them. So if we don't have it, I can't do that. Um, I don't specifically have a, a real question question, but some of the things that have come up, including the um, communications, um, the security concerns, um, the 504 plan positions and things like that are things that I think need greater conversations than sitting here at, the, at this table right now. Um, but I would like very much to have those conversations. Um, one of the things that um, was mentioned by one of our students, actually, um, in reference to the mental health resources and things, um, kind of also clicked in my mind um, as I was listening to other people talk from about different schools. Um, you know, I know I think I had gotten an update uh, not that long ago um, from uh, Ms. Rubin about there are mental health day uh, possibilities. And um, one of the things that we continue to talk about is the uh, idea of a, an assembly so that students can be introduced to all of the um, um, sent, uh, social and emotional wellness workers that are in their schools and, and what they all do um, and see who they are. Um, <clears throat> I'll look forward to getting an update on the progress of that. Um, and um, 
there was something else and now I can't remember. So anyways, I'll let it go. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, uh, again, just really uh, appreciate the constructive nature of so much of this testimony. Um, and just a couple of follow-ups. Uh, one, I think Mr. Bassey mentioned um, still concerns at Greencastle Elementary about a dead zone in communications. And I thought we had kind of done that, that survey work at all of our schools in the start of the school year. Can we just check on that uh, and make sure that that's Galway. Galway, sorry, sorry, Galway Elementary, that dead zone report. Um, and then um, one of the themes that I did hear was, it, and we've been talking about it, we talked about it yesterday at the work session, um, the fact that it, our staffing methods and formulas that we've established over time maybe aren't really keeping pace with some of the fluidity we're seeing in our schools these days. We're seeing increased mobility, um, newcomers coming into our schools kind of consistently throughout the year. And, um, and so as we look at our staffing models and our, our staffing, you know, the 90 plus percent of this three, somebody said we need to spend more on our uh, staff mentioning a couple million dollars. I mean, 92% of this $3.2 billion goes to staff. So um, it is a very people heavy budget, but looking at um, how we can make it possible to allocate staff possibly more fluidly through the year. Um, there was a mention of the uh, Flower Hill farms rate approaching 70% now, and they could use the additional counseling support. Um, mentioning things around as um, it gets, can be hard at the very beginning of a school year to sort of predict maybe what your um, act school access patterns are going to be as far as just how people get there during the day. Mr. Bassey mentioned having some security staff to diffuse, um, you know, traffic conflicts of people driving their kids, but also needs for crossing guards for the walkers and can't necessarily see that in the first couple of weeks of school, but how we're communicating with our school administrators that um, we know that the picture of your school evolves through the year and please to be um, comfortable communicating um, needs that are more fluid around sort of these kinds of things. And I don't know how that affects our budget, but just sort of our kind of our mindset and our, and our kind of school culture of we want to be talking, we, we talk about two-way communication as a huge priority, but making sure our school administrators <coughs> understand too, that's an expectation from them as well. And we, it's nobody, um, would look down on a school administrator who communicates fluid needs as they emerge. Um, and the question about, I mean, this is Ms. Hazel. Yes, she's still here. Um, a very good point about that we are seeing such success with the structured literacy. But when we look at our community of, of learners who d didn't receive that or aren't receiving that because they've already, they're already in, the, in grade levels that are higher where we're implementing that, is there a way to without any kind of stigma, weave some of that structured literacy content into our upper grade um, English learners, or I mean just English courses. Yeah, so we actually did train all of our teachers K to five with structured literacy this summer. Um, more of our focus throughout the school year is on our primary grades, but we did give our upper grade teachers background and training on that so that there is an expectation that there is a portion of that instruction taking place during their literacy block. In addition to um, providing them with the interventions and other um, reteaching, small groups, instruction, things of that nature, so that we can make sure that we're catching students up. So we're working with our reading specialists and our staff development teachers to provide support to all of our teachers, including our upper grade teachers around how to support students who might have missed some of that instruction during the pandemic. Is there, and I think one of the, the points that was made was that, um, is Ms. Glassman still here? I think maybe she, she oh, hello. Um, <laughs> that um, even in the high school grades, some of the structured literacy approach could be very beneficial. Yeah. Is there, are we doing any work on, I guess, professional development at, in our high school English instructors to recognize and support those learners with that kind of structured literacy content? We started having some conversations about that when we first began with our pilot around how we move this up into our secondary levels, looking more at middle school. Um, so that is a conversation that we will continue to have about how we make that happen. I know when we were working with our 
um, we had a group of community members that we were working with, and I know that was a big push as well. So we'll continue to look into how we move that work into uh, our secondary schools. It's not currently happening, but we'll, we'll look into that. Yeah, a good, good ideas. We keep hearing these good ideas. Yes. Um, and then the last question I have circles back to some of the conversation we had last year. We continue to hear how over uh, worked our counseling staff is, and we know we've known for years that um, we don't approach that American Counseling Association um, recommended ratio. Um, but one of the things we talked about last year was ensuring that all of our credentialed staff, our wellness credentialed staff, our counselors, psychologists, uh, LCSWs, weren't being burdened with any tasks that didn't require their license or expertise and maybe bringing in administrative staff to be part of those wellness teams to take some of those burdens away so they could, in fact, spend all of their time on, you know, focused, you know, using their credentials in essence. And did, is that something that we're actually looking on in our staffing models is to provide more of that administrative support to those professionals? I'm happy to answer. Um, we don't have actually administrative staffing. What we offered the schools were, was TPT time. And so we have staff members who are able, so for example, the um, administrative secretary in counseling, TPT time can be allotted to her to be able to do some of those other administrative duties. And then she's compensated in addition for doing that to take that weight off of the counseling some of the other counseling staff. So that is brand new, you're absolutely right. We were able to implement that. We're also looking at, I do wanna say, the balance of the mental health staff that we have. And we know we have some work to maybe get everyone to work really well together, but it isn't just all on the counselors. We now have the social workers, right? Licensed clinicians, we have the wellness center staff. So that will take time for us to get there, but that is additionally how we've taken away some of that burden. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kim. Uh, yeah, I, I just had a, another clarifying question about that, that 504 piece, so those two, I think, 504 instructional specialists uh, that were mentioned earlier. So uh, the approach that we're taking there is so professional training for staff around 504s and IEPs as opposed, and that's distinct from alleviating that, that 504 casework um, from counselors. Yes, so our model, if you look at there are some other models where there's an entire um, staffing unit that's dedicated to 504, just as in Montgomery County, we've seen the growth, just as in other places. So that's a little separate because okay. it's about getting to the professional learning across the system. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's continue with our testimony. Up next, we have Ciara Caprara. Good evening, Board of Education members and Dr. McKnight. I am Sierra Caprera, co-president of the Montgomery County School Psychologist Association and the current Maryland State School Psychologist of the Year. On behalf of my colleagues in MCPS, I'm here to speak about the importance of increasing salaries so that MCPS can fill its vacant school psychologist positions. Filling vacant school psychologist positions can ensure that all schools and special education programs in the county have equitable access to the assessment, counseling, consultation, and crisis-related services that school psychologists provide to the schools they serve. I have appreciated the collaboration with MCPS leaders and the Board of Education and steps that we have taken together to try to find solutions to challenges with recruitment and retention of school psychologists in MCPS over the past year. Smaller steps that we have taken, such as increasing the number of 12-month school psychologist positions and additional compensation for school psychologists completing a larger workload, have helped to keep our precarious level of staffing from getting worse. However, we are not out of the woods yet. MCPS continues to have over 30 vacant school psychology positions. It is clear that bigger and bolder steps will need to be taken to fill these vacant positions. MCPS currently has the lowest starting salary for school psychologists among our neighboring counties, which include Frederick, Howard, Anne Arundel, and Prince George's. Lower salaries have made it very difficult for MCPS to recruit and retain school psychologists. 
My fear is that this is becoming a cycle. As some school psychologists retire or leave, MCPS will continue to struggle to fill those new vacancies as well as the existing vacancies. That increased workload will fall to those school psychologists who remain at MCPS until they can no longer bear the burden of being overworked and underpaid. As a result, starting this year, many school psychologists were given an additional school because of the current vacancies. With the majority of school psychologists each solely serving three or more schools, they have to make either or decisions about which services can be provided and what can be accomplished in a school day. My hope for the future well-being of MCPS's children and families is that MCPS will be able to hire enough school psychologists so that each school psychologist serves fewer schools and is able to say yes and to all of the needs of all of our children and families. Yes, I can assess children to figure out what interferes with their learning. And I have time to teach children how to manage their feelings and navigate social situations. And I have time to sponsor emotional well-being student groups like Our Minds Matter. And I have time to support children's experiencing emotional crises. And I have time to help teachers use strategies to support children's social, emotional, and behavioral well-being. And I have time to monitor and celebrate student progress. And I have time to lead school-wide and district-wide social emotional learning initiatives, such as the MCPS Mental Health Awareness Week. And I have time to provide trainings to parents and educators and. This list can go on and on. This list of services and even more are already offered by MCPS school psychologists. However, it is currently impossible for MCPS to reach its potential in terms of the amount of these services and their consistent implementation across all of its schools until it is able to recruit and retain more school psychologists by improving their salary. Thank you for your time and consideration. Up next, we'll hear from Janice Campbell. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education members and Dr. McKnight. My name is Janice Campbell, and I'm one of the co-presidents of the Montgomery County School Psychologists Association. I serve Montgomery Blair High School and the Down County Transitions programs. Firstly, on behalf of MCSPA, I would like to thank the BOE for recognizing the need for more psychologists and over recent years, allocating those positions in the budget, as well as increasing the number of 12-month positions. However, there remains a significant pay difference between MCPS and the surrounding districts, with starting salaries ranging between 10,000 to 17,000 less in MCPS. This has placed us in the unfortunate position of struggling to recruit and retain psychologists, and we currently have over 30 positions unfilled. Many of our surrounding counties are paying psychologists on a separate salary scale. Potential new hires, as well as past employees, have accepted these more lucrative financial offers, which also correlates with smaller caseloads. A recent article in Chalkbeat showed that among the largest school districts across the country, MCPS had the largest negative impact with a 33 percentage loss of school psychologists between fall 2019 and fall 2022. These vacancies has had, have an adverse impact on our abilities to serve the needs of our students, including their mental health needs. As you're aware, Blair is the largest high school in the state. Another psychologist was previously assigned two days per week. However, due to the vacancies, in addition to an elementary school, she was also assigned a middle school, and her time at Blair has been reduced to one day per week. Our supervisors have had to make similar decisions across the district in order to serve our students. Personally, this has resulted in a caseload of approximately 2,500 students when the recommended ratio from the National Association of School Psychologists is 1 to 500. In 2009, when I migrated to the US, school psychologists were listed as a critical shortage area and this nationwide shortage has continued. In order to allow MCPS to recruit and retain psychologists, we are asking the Board of Ed to consider a salary scale for psychologists that is competitive so that we can equitably meet the diverse needs of our students. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Raina Wortlieb. Oh. 
Good evening. My name is Raina Wortlieb. I'm a third generation Montgomery County teacher, and I'm in my third year of teaching first grade at Sligo Creek Elementary School. I'm a lifelong Montgomery County resident and a former MCPS student. I have now been a working teacher for nearly 450 days. That's 450 days of work that I have questioned if my dream of becoming a teacher was the right choice, a choice my whole life I felt was absolute. Managing a classroom of young children comes with inherent challenges at the best of times. But in August of 2020, my first year as a teacher, the entire global community faced an unprecedented shift. Meeting my students virtually and teaching remotely for more than six months was a necessary safety measure, but it deeply impacted the teaching, learning, and social experience for us all. Between the difficulty in engaging students with virtual learning, the risks posed by in-person instruction, and a salary that is low compared with other professions, teachers started leaving their jobs. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were approximately 10.6 million educators working in public education in January 2020. Today, there are just 10 million, a net loss of around 600,000. The same Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated that the annual projected net loss of teachers from 2016 to 2026 was only 100,000 per year. To see that number double to 200,000 is telling, and it's already having a dramatic effect on our county and our country. Fewer teachers mean staffing shortages. Staffing shortages means that classroom teachers must do the work of substitute teachers who are also in short supply. We are required to provide class coverage for other teachers at the embarrassing rate of $15 a day. During time scheduled for planning, paperwork, and just to take a breath. When teachers lose our planning time, lessons only meet the bare minimum for content and creativity. When teachers don't have time to eat lunch or use the bathroom, we are not operating at full capacity. This county is asking its teachers for their best while actively depriving them of the bare minimum compensation and aid necessary for them to perform as expected. I grew up excited to learn in this county. I left college excited to teach in this county. I now stand here addressing those who can help this county but this is now a county I no longer even recognize. New qualified teachers are leaving for higher paying jobs in other fields and other school districts. Fields and school districts who are at the very least combating record inflation with competitive compensation. As the wealthiest county in the state, there is no excuse not to pay our teachers the most competitive salaries. If we want to attract and retain the best educators, MCPS must offer competitive wages and benefits for the sake of our educators, our students, and our community. There was a time when MCPS was the standard for education. Now is the time for Montgomery County to reestablish itself as Maryland's most exceptional school district. So, Dr. McKnight, I must ask, what will you do when there are no teachers to work for you? Up next, we'll hear from Kara Farrell. Kara Farrell. All right, let's move on to Elizabeth Meyer. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Elizabeth Meyer, and I'm a first year teacher at RICA, a school dedicated to special education students with emotional and behavioral needs. I myself was a special education student in a general education school in MCPS for 12 years. What I see offered now to my students compared to my experience as a mainstream special ed student is abysmal. My background is in STEM. This year I'm teaching five classes, two in biology, two in algebra one, and a US history course. I am not a trained history teacher and only took on the role because there was a staffing shortage at the start of the year. History is not my area of expertise, so I'm learning as I teach, but there is only so much self-teaching I can do. This problem is compounded by staffing shortages that eat up my planning time. In the six days, in the, in the si seven days we've been back since winter break, I've covered six of them. I've covered on six of them. And on Friday last week, I had no planning time at all because I had to cover somebody's class and I had an IEP meeting. We need qualified substitutes who show up for their assignments so that classroom teachers can focus on the preparation and planning required to adequately address our high need student population. Our 100 student school receives about $11,000 in funding, a per pupil spending that is barely over half of what MCPS 
spends on general education students. This is not acceptable. We need funding to attract support staff and new teachers to re retain the quality educators already employed by MCPS and to provide our students with the best environment and wor working and learning materials. Our principal is trying. She has hired a new history teacher who is work who is taking my history class next semester. But that does not redress a whole semester of learning history from a math teacher. As a math teacher, my, as a teacher, my primary concern is the well-being and education of my students. MCPS can and must fully fund our system so that all of our students get the quality educational experience they deserve. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Camilla Rankin. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Camilla Rankin and I'm a nationally certified school psychologist in MCPS. I love my work as a school psychologist with the preschool special education program. Currently, students are facing more social and emotional challenges than ever under the pressure of the pandemic and we school psychologists are there to help them navigate the ever-changing landscape. I love my job, but I worry that I'm not doing enough to make a difference. Currently, there are just over 100 school psychologists supporting 210 schools and special programs. When we're working with students, it takes time to build trust and to get to know each student and their unique social and emotional, their unique social and emotional needs. And how can we do that if we're burdened with unreasonable caseloads, coverage of schools without a school psychologist, and inadequate time for case management and supporting our school teams? My pride and joy come from building relationships with staff, students, families, and, and the community to help all students flourish in and beyond the academic environment. However, helping students thrive becomes extremely difficult to achieve while, when, um, I'm sorry, when time and energy has, has to be spent on advocating for a healthy work-life balance. We school psychologists did not choose this profession to become rich, we chose the profession to help students succeed academically, socially, behaviorally, and emotionally. We chose this profession like the majority of educators in hopes of making the world a better place. However, we are continuously faced with untenable conditions. At this time, MCPS has 31.8 positions open for school psychologists. There are eight schools without a dedicated site, with a, I'm sorry, there are eight schools without a dedicated psychologist and those that have psychologists may only see them in the building once or twice a week. The average school psychologist to student ratio in MCPS is one to 1,400, with some school psychologists having notably higher ratios of one to 2,600, which is significantly higher than our NAS, recommend, our NAS recommended ratio of one to 500 students. MCPS has been unable to fill the outstanding school psychologist positions also due to the lack of competitive salaries with surrounding school districts, some of which have separate salary scales for school psychologists. We are simply stretched too thin. At a time when students are presenting with increased psychological needs, we need more school psychologists in the schools. When students' emotional needs aren't met, every aspect of their lives are are, every aspect of their lives is affected from academic performance to socialization, just across the board. Our students deserve better. Our students need the supports provided by the school psychological services to succeed in MCPS and beyond. The students of today will become the superintendents and advocates of change of tomorrow and we have a responsibility to ensure that every child's fullest potential can be reached. Uh, we, Sorry, we want to work with you to fully staff every school's psychological services offices because every child deserves to foster Thank holistic well being. Thank you. Up next, we have Ellie Kleinman. Do I need to? Do I, I'm good, okay. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Ellie Kleinman and I'm a school counselor at New Hampshire State's Elementary School in Silver Spring. New Hampshire State's is a primary school serving the highest farms rate population in MCPS at almost 90%. We also serve a high immigrant population and have an ELD student population of almost 70%. I've testified before you on several prior occasions, and each year I come back to ask you once again, 
to increase the number of mental health professionals in our schools to meet the American School Counseling Association recommended ratio of one counselor to 250 students for all schools at all levels. Currently, ratios are as high as one to 600 in certain elementary schools. At present, the MCEA is pursuing a one to 150 school counselor to student ratio for all Title I and focus schools as part of collective bargaining. And this is something I strongly support as well. And I also request that you establish 504 coordinator positions to manage 504 cases across MCPS. Sadly, our cur current mental health system is not set up to sufficiently meet the mental health needs of our students. This deficit has significant impacts both on student learning and on staff well-being. The needs that we see on a daily basis as counselors are just too high to manage manage adequately and efficiently with the human resources that we have available today, and our students are suffering as a result. In a typical week, our crisis response team is called at least three times to respond to incidents where students are presenting a danger, either to themselves, to other students, or to staff, and we work with student learner, uh, young learners in grades pre-K to second grade, and that's as high as we go. As counselors, we're supposed to spend 80% of our time providing direct services to students. Direct services include things like individual and group counseling, monthly cu classroom guidance lessons at the elementary level. With all of the required paperwork around managing 504 plans, counselors at the elementary and at the secondary level lose countless hours that could be used to support students. High school counselors typically have as many as 50 504 plans on their caseloads. The lack of sufficient counselor staffing across the district at the elementary level means the students must often wait multiple days or sometimes weeks to see a counselor. And this is because between dealing with crises, managing 504 plans and paperwork, attending meetings and fulfilling legal compliance when counselors are inappropriately written into IEPs, the amount of time that counselors have to meet the social emotional needs of the vast majority of our students is inadequate. Having too few counselors also affects both the mental health and morale of MCPS staff because everyone from teachers to paraeducators to administrators are impacted when the mental health needs of our students remain unmet. This creates the potential consequence of losing teachers and staff from the profession at a time when we can ill afford to do so. The pandemic has had after effects that are not going away. We need to acknowledge this and respond with urgency. MCPS can, can and should do better, and it's time to make the required budgetary changes to provide ad adequate counseling supports to elementary schools with a minimum of a one to 250 counselor to student ratio. I'm respectfully requesting that you resolve the inadequacy of the elementary counseling ratios once and for all, and that you establish 504 coordinator positions in order to free up counselors to do what they became school counselors for, to serve and support students. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your testimony. Now we will take uh, board comments, starting uh, on my left. Please turn on your lights if you have a comment. Ms. Harris. Um, just a, a follow-up, um, talking about the opening, the 30, I think I wrote it down probably incorrectly, uh, 31.8 opening, school psychologist openings. Mm -hmm. Do we have that broken down by whether they're 10-month or 12-month positions? And I know that was an issue that we talked about a couple years ago. Um, that some of our school psychologists suggesting more of our positions be 12 month and that would be help with the salary bump but yes correct um, that was something that we did last year there was a work group that was uh, that came together to um, talk about how we could one make more 12 month positions to be able to support support students and their families throughout the entire year not just the school year wanting to extend over summer and then of course we also had some staff who um, you know would want to continue to work the 10 month schedule so that was a, a change that we made last year um, and of course we um, made some financial investments in that in being able to move some of the positions from 10 months to 12 months mm -hmm. after that work group was able to complete the work um, but we absolutely can break that down and send it to the board if that is what you're requesting to see how many we have in each at the different schools. It's I think it would be just just general, uh, just general information, but also looking at, um, as they were mentioning, the salary scale. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I know we've seen a variety of those, but it would be good to look at our, our um, school psychologist salary yeah. scale in, in <coughs> comparison to surrounding jurisdictions. and. I'm going to ask this question, which I should know the answer to. Um, I'm looking over at Mr. Klossick and Ms. Alf Alphonse. Um, every, so I know that the MCPS benefit package is really quite generous and one of the most mm -hmm. generous of any of the LEAs. Does, but does that benefit package accrue to every employee? 
It's not, it's not limited to specific association employees, but all employees, okay. Yes. Okay. Our benefits package unless fall, is the same for all full-time employees, um, and of course it's differentiated for employees who work part-time. Um, I did want to, um, to, to circle back to what you were saying earlier. Um, when we think of the, the comparison, first thank you to those who came and shared, because as you know, this year we did a deep dive in really looking at um, how our salaries compared to other jurisdictions in the state, just to make sure um, as we work with the associations, we were all starting from the same base information. Um, we will follow up and look at the psychologist to see where we are with that because, um, you know, we want to make sure we have parity and most importantly, we want to be competitive. And my last question goes to, so we're hearing again, um, specifically from Ms. Meyer and Ms. Wortley um, about uh, substitutes. How are we with our substitute teaching pool this year? And, you know, are we, it sounds like we are still burdened with many unfilled substitute teaching roles. I can't um. There we go. Thank you. Uh, we do not have anyone from Human Resources here this evening, but we can follow. Brian, you want to speak? Okay, very good. Mr. Hall. Um, we are still having uh, trouble filling our substitute pool, and as it was noted um, by another speaker tonight, too, that impacts you know, when other teachers are forced to provide coverage because there isn't a substitute. And so that is something that we're working on. We have uh, deployed several um, full uh, permanent subs to schools that have uh, chronically high absentee rates of staff. Um, so we're trying to address it through, through that angle as well. Um, and we are working with our association partners to make sure that teachers are compensated um, if they are covering additional classes. And so you said, I thought we had, de we had dramatically increased that coverage stipe, I don't know what you call it, but when a, when a teacher gives up their planning time or whatever to cover, I thought it was more than $15. Um, it had been raised significantly during COVID because there was so much coverage. Okay. Um, the MOU for that expired on June 30th of this past year, and so we are currently in discussions with MCEA about uh, extending that or, uh, you know, re-upping it for this year and then part of our larger contract negotiations is what that's going to look like going forward. It will be more than $15 per hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall, for saying that. I just wanted to add on um, both the associations and the system came forward with that being an interest that we both wanted to negotiate this year because what we had to pay or needed to pay our employees during the pandemic was significant. Um, and so we both agreed that we wanted to be able to do something that would be sustainable over time and also fair. So, uh, I mean, I think the conversation's well underway and it actually happens nicely when both parties come to the table saying this is something that we want to resolve. Um, I have one comment. Um, thank you for everyone for coming out uh, to testify. Now, um, part of as our school system, um, we are advocating um, with our needs to different levels of government uh, agencies um, and government, different level of government. Uh, I understand that this year in the Ways and Means uh, Committee, there is a bill that addressed the related service uh, salary uh, that was not covered in the blueprint, uh, such as the speech pathologist, occupation therapist. So maybe uh, we will do a stronger advocate for some uh, our school psychologist, which is also not covered under the blueprint. So um, we need to be creative, thinking about uh, different ways um, to um, meet the needs of our staff and our students. You know that will benefit our students. Thank you. Ms. Yang, thank you. I just wanted to comment on that, and that is really important. We've been having a lot of conversations about the blueprint, and the reason that becomes important in this conversation in terms of how the blueprint defines these positions that it acknowledges is because then if they acknowledge it in that way, then that money comes to us from the state. If they don't, then that means we then have to find that money locally. So I really appreciate that because uh, oftentimes when we think about the advocacy that's needed around the interests that we all share, um, 
<laughs> much of the advocacy really does have to be extended beyond us locally. I mean, so I hope that you know this has been informative to you in that way, and we'll continue to share out information in terms of how these interests that you share that we also share um, can be shared in other spaces to help support what we need to do together. Just, um, thank you, just a quick comment. Um, I just want to say um, thank you to all of you for, for coming tonight. Your work and your passion is valuable to the care and the TLC that our children and our youth need. So you, you truly are doing God's work. Um, to Mrs. Meyer, thank you so much for learning as you're going on, you know, with history. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's always wonderful to see uh, folks like yourself step up for, for the kids' sakes. Um, this has been really hard times for everyone, I think, during the, the pandemic. As somebody mentioned, we have lost so many, so many good souls and teachers to this profession. Please do not get discouraged. Um, uh, teaching is, is a vocation, um, and your passion and love for it, it's very evident here tonight. Please do not get discouraged. We need... We need good soldiers in the field. And I just want to say that my question was going to be about, about the pay, since we are facing such a hardship with um, even substitutes and teachers have to jump in um, to save the day, really, and to make sure that we keep on moving. I'm so grateful to hear that those conversations are taking place. So I encourage you to keep engaged. And I encourage all of you to also, as my colleague, um, Ms. Yang said, to make sure your advocacy just goes beyond these walls, but also goes beyond because there is funding out there to ensure that we get what we need for our children. So thank you so much for being here. All right. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for coming tonight. Um, as usual, we look forward to these hearings because um, not only do we hear the impact of what's happening in the field, but we also get an opportunity to hear some solutions. And I must say tonight, from the beginning of this hearing, there were so many great solutions that were brought forward that are really good things that we can work with. So I do look forward to us following up. And to our students, thank you for hanging in with there with us late, as well as the staff. I know you've been out all day, uh, you know, working and, and taking care of things. So. Um, no, and our parents, I mean, every, thank you for not just sharing your own personal experiences, but those of others who you work with all the time. We heard you. We look forward to following up and, most importantly, helping you to help us um, vision how we can work out some of these uh, things that you brought forward as stakeholders. So know that I appreciate it. Thank you so much. With that, we are adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>